it in. But yeah, this is a chance for you to like, yeah, finish your breakfast slash lunch slash whatever <laughs> meal you're working on. I suspect we'll probably start about like five minutes after the hour. So finish eating in four minutes. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're up to it. Good morning, I Sam. The challenge. So how are things in Vancouver these days, Eli? Ah, you know, it's springtime, which means like the magnolias are out and uh, it's raining, you know, all the all the lovely things. <laughs> the magnolias are out. It's the same. It's strange, strangely enough, it's about the same here in Seattle. Almost we like are, we're right. We're, we're only, a, you know, 100 miles or so apart. That's right. You know, <laughs> I always get to explain to people like, you know, Seattle, that's Vancouver. We're the same thing. <laughs> I think you guys get a little you guys get a little harsher weather than we do. As I recall, I lived in Bellingham for a while, and the weather was certainly was more was was more rainier hmm. and windier because I think it blows right off the ocean there instead of Seattle's no, got a bunch we're, of mountains. We're actually we're both protected by you know having like you have a peninsula, we've got an island. So. Oh, that's right, because Vancouver Island's right there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so we both have some level of protection. Yeah, so we're not like exposed West Coast. You know, that's where you get like. <laughs> the terrible fogs in San Francisco, the stuff you just don't really get here in Vancouver, or I suspect Seattle. No, Seattle's per boring. It's boring and constant. Goes. That's what people want in their lives. <laughs> something dependable. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind an occasional Midwest thunderstorm. So oh, occasional, occasional wrath of God thunderstorm rolling through. <laughs> I miss those from when I was living in Chicago. The lake, the lake will come at you, you know. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think... go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Should we just kick things off? Who else do we have in the room? Like, you know, people are still stumbling in, but like, mm -hmm. you know, we just talked about, you know, Matthew and I are both like West Coasters, you know, here in North America. But who else do we have here with us? Sam, you've come on camera, so or sorry, Samurai, you've come on camera. I may put you on the spot. A spot for what? <laughs> so, where are you at? Oh, I'm with Edutopia. Excellent. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm sorry I haven't been able to make one of these before. It just as you, you know, as everyone's been, it's been really super busy. Yeah. Over the last twelve months. Where do you work out of? Uh, well, this is my office at home. <laughs> <laughs> like us all. Yeah, yeah. So we're we've been remote for uh, since last March, so it's been a full year now. Uh, ever since the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. I think we actually went remote a week before. Everybody Does that mean you've got more time with the instruments behind oh, you? Oh, I wish I could play them. I've, it's it's one of those well-meaning, we got them on, we went to holiday in um, in Hawaii. And I was like, okay, and I took some lessons and then got busy and then took some lessons and got busy. <laughs> and and I think the last time I took one of them down was uh, two months ago, just to kind of strum it a little bit, so. No, I have other things I do for for free time. Well, either way, they yeah, still no, look great. great. So, uh... <laughs> as art, they're beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, I'm glad you can hear me. Okay, I was, this is my first time using um, the Connect software. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. I think every at least from everyone's a little jumpy on camera. The internet's so nice busy today. It's so nice to be using something other than Zoom for a while. <laughs> <laughs> this is where well, we. Yeah. I've I, my boss always talks about that too. She's just like, it's like, oh, it's it's a different video conferencing system. I know. How exciting. This is where we've come to after a year. We're like, it's the that's the real the real excitement in life is like I'm gonna use gonna use something else. I'm putting together. I do these. I do these live streams for for my community fairly regularly, and I use Zoom. Basically, I use Zoom, and then we use something. We use a 
the, a, an intermediary to to take the Zoom stuff and put it into a live stream. Um, and I do that all the time. But then tomorrow, oh, no, no, wait a minute, Friday, I'm doing one with WebEx instead of instead of Zoom, and it's this oh, whole wow. other world. I'm like, whoa, this is exciting. I get to do I get to do a live stream with WebEx instead of Zoom. It's where I, it's this is my life. It's 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 it's, it's thrilling. Have you guys played around with um, Run the World yet? Oh my gosh, it's kind of fun. They have this cocktail party feature. I mean, so they have a lot of different types of formats of like web conferences or like small group engagements, but they're trying to create online experiences. And What's it called? Run the World. Run like the World. Song. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, she I'm was like a now. Forbes 30 under 30 for coming up with this anyway it's really cool their cocktail party feature like when you're you're in a meetup and you click on cocktail party it will do people it'll put people in like essentially one-on-one -on -one breakout groups for like however many minutes you want and then at the end of it they get to opt in whether or not they want to share both share contact information and like meet each other and huh. then it puts them in the next one and then you just go through and do these like five minute like cocktail meetups bumping into people and then exchange info with the people you're interested in and i thought it was really fun that is i'm already getting like a nervous sweat <laughs> yeah, so it is it. It's speed dating for, for networking and i thought that was really, that was like an interesting vibe i liked it, it, like it. did any of y'all get a chance um i don't know this is about a year ago, so i think um cmx was helping a uh, uh, startup called icebreaker mm, beta test fun. there beta so test their there. service that was very fun. Yeah, it was a similar sort of thing. I I I, I tried to get my organization to use it, and everyone went. Aah! They didn't want it, and they 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 they, they weren't they weren't uh, people weren't as excited as me about it. But um, I was so excited about Icebreaker. I thought it was so fun. I love the fact that they had facilitated um, questions. Mm -hmm. I thought that part was really great because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people freeze when they're like five minutes. What do I talk about? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's I, mean, I should go back and I should go back and look at it. Is it similar to Run the World, or like um, like in a more? So Run the World has several different formats. So Cocktail Party is one of their formats, and that is similar to I. Cocktail mm -hmm. Party is similar to Icebreaker. Yeah, I always felt like Icebreaker was was a feature, but definitely I could see how it could be subsumed yes. by another yes. platform. So I've been throwing some of these links into the chat. Um, I think actually this might be, you know, maybe a good way for us yeah. to like start up a conversation today. Just talk about like, how are we in this time keeping the communities, our communities together? Um, and I really think of that right now because for me this week, they're hosting the annual nonprofit technology conference, which was always the signature hey, event for the larger community I'm part of. Um, you know, it's the place where I'd always get to meet up with like 20 of my volunteers face to face. Um, and I didn't have to pay to get them there <laughs> because they were already there. So it was always super efficient. I never went to any of these sessions. I just went and like took people up for coffee, like one after another, boom, 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 boom and just my, ran my way through that to sort of like strengthen the relationships that were otherwise online. I don't get that shortcut right now. Um, and so I think things like, you know, icebreaker, things like that, where we can sort of force people into these more mm -hmm. intimate places um, is I think really interesting. Um, but yeah, we've got some new people showing up. Um, so yeah, Pamela, where are hey, you at? I'm in um, Northern California. And hi, Samer. Hi, Pamela. You're, you were on a list of people I was going to contact. So I'm so happy to see you here. <laughs> uh, that how fortuitous. <laughs> I know. Oh, this is excellent. Uh, getting everything done on my to-do list. Um, I'm here. I, you know, mostly I work in the education sector, but nonprofit also. Um, in the last year, I've been doing this as an independent contractor. And, um, but specifically, I'm working with public libraries who do, um, right now, who do maker programs or hands-on STEM and art programs. And I've been running some grants on that in the state. And we're setting out, Samar, we're setting out to create a collective of people, librarians who do this across the nation. We just, 
we just uh, submitted a grant application, a federal grant. The collective, and since you lead a community of teachers, it's very similar, and we're hoping it works. <laughs> but I also work with fire, wildfire survivors, too, and I just entered that community by default since my house burned down in a fire. Well, that's right. And I, yeah, and I um, am now have a six-month contract working with an organization, a nonprofit that is going to help communities navigate through the minute their house burns down to rebuilding. And they're working with uh, the co affected communities in Oregon and in Santa Cruz and those places that had fires last fall. And they don't have anybody who does communications yet or does that community piece. And so they're bringing me on to help with that. So it's two different worlds, but really it's about helping people connect and learn together. And that's the kind of things I do. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. What's the wildfire nonprofit's name? Um, well, it's called Rebuild North Bay Foundation, but they're changing their name and rebranding to be called After the Fire since it's not, not only the North mm -hmm. Bay anymore. And oh my God, the other question I have today about is like rebrand since I'm about to take on that particular pain as well. Yeah, but, so sorry, that's go the ahead. first thing they're going to have me do is read their entire website because they want to build a new website and figure out what navigates over and what doesn't. somebody else joining us as well they're also bringing in an interesting community engagement tool um, that uses maps like s3 maps but not only s3 but other maps and people can pin their comments on these development projects and it's publicly accessible um, oh, cool so that it can be used by governments and it's really interesting yeah do you know what the name of the tool is yeah I I do but I have to it's um I have to look it up. I'm going to get it wrong. It's based in Australia. Okay. I mean, because one of the cool things about maps is that they are so flexible and what you can do with them in terms of like geographic mapping of I know. what they're doing. It's called Social Pinpoint. Social Pinpoint. Yes. I did. I went, I watched their, uh, I mean, I participated in a demo of it. They're thinking of buying licenses and then granting them to these organ these communities after, like, should they need them? Good morning, Eric. Well, that's neat. Virtual town. Like virtual town hall kind of yeah. thing, but tied to mapping, which is the mm -hmm. cool thing. Oh, triple unmuting. Well, succeed. You succeeded. You're here. I've seen something like this. City of Seattle, I've seen do use this particular service, but I've seen them do things like that to, to do surveys and stuff like that to engage, like, uh -huh. like when they're trying to get community feedback on projects or, or, um, yeah, maybe it's the same tool. I don't know, but yeah, yeah I've stuck it in the Slack. Wonder in the software Slack, wondering if people knew about other t similar tools or if they had experience with this one. It's interesting. I know when I know in our neighborhood burned down, we we got an S3 license and we tried to understand the data using that, but we didn't have a pre-built tool like this one to tie the community to it. And it's so helpful. Um, so I thought it was cool. Anyway, I don't want to monopolize the sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the session today is, you know, yeah. is open <laughs> for us basically just, to, you know, talk with like, you know, people who are nerdy <laughs> about the same stuff we are. Um, we're actually doing something, uh, since we're talking about tools, we're doing something really old school, which we've never, but we've never done it in the history of the what, 30 years of Edutopia and the foundation, which is we have a toll free phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean to, like an actual human being with the, on the other end? <laughs> no, no, no. It goes straight to voicemail, but it's a way for us to capture audio from, uh, from everyone basically who wants to call in from in North America toll free. And oh. So it's a way for, so just, we're always looking for content. We're always looking to elevate teacher voices. And so 
uh, we asked a question and people are calling in and we're capturing the audio we're vetting it and then we hopefully we'll turn it into content for our, our audience that's, that's a really neat idea i love that there, yeah yeah so we, we we took inspiration from the new york times primal screen project Do you, have you have you all seen that no Link us oh up. my god yeah look it up so new york times primal screen what they did is they opened up a phone line for the moms to just you know primal scream into the phone talk about their <laughs> and, and the difficulties and it's something that i've you know i personally have been interested in doing for a while so finding some way to capture um these voices and it just i i don't know why it didn't occur to me is like just capture like literally capture the voices yeah yeah and so and it's really really low barrier as opposed to getting someone to say like just explain to some people like here's how you record something on your phone and then you have yeah. to like email it over here and it's that's just like right. it's it's here i understand it like that's a really neat lower idea lower the barrier i really like that idea we're in, in my organization we're we're trying to put together a series of uh videos um kind of highlighting the voices of, of different uh marginalized communities kind of in co coinciding with different, different awareness months and we did one for we did one for Black History Month, uh, and it went really well. Um, but it's like it's so difficult trying to get people to trying to connect with people to feature. Um, and I think now, part of that is that it's like here we're going to do this thing, and we're going to have a video, and we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and and record yourself, and make sure the lighting's okay, and 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 on and on and on and on and on, and it's really it's really high barrier. Just, libraries have really gotten into that a lot with their storytelling and history collection projects and getting oral histories. And um, there are more than one project out there that that facilitates that, brings in the tech, helps mm -hmm. the community come in, intergenerational mm -hmm. or different things. Um, and some of those are ending up in the Library of Congress as actually records of our mm -hmm. cultural history. That's so, That's cool. so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a fabulous insight, which is just yeah. lower the barrier. Like I keep on doing these things, like give me a little video yeah. clip. It'll be easy. It, it's still way too high barrier. Mm -hmm. And I keep on failing with those campaigns. So actually I love the idea of taking it to the phone, just making it super duper mm -hmm. duper simple. Um, I also just want to welcome our two latest arrivals. Um, we've got Caitlin who's just arrived who Thanks. can't come on camera, but uh, if you want, you can do a really quick intro also by phone if that works for you. And we've also got Mercedes. Um, again, if you want to come join us on camera, we'd love to chat with you. Otherwise, give us a quick intro in the chat. Hi, I can actually speak, so I'm happy to <laughs> speak. But for some reason, <laughs> cannot figure out my video. I will have to learn how to do it on here. But um, actually, love that you mentioned um, the oral history projects, Pamela. And I'm going to send share, share a little link here. I'm, um, I'm based in Brooklyn. And actually, in my spare time, working on um, an oral history project of just this past year in uh, my North Brooklyn neighborhood. So um, there's a pretty cool list that they put together in New York City about um, different projects like that that are happening and it's just you know it's just a really amazing way to form community and you know my oral history work definitely comes into my my work 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 <laughs> um, but I so my name is Caitlin um, as I said I'm based in um, in Brooklyn I work for the Leverage Ed Foundation we're still a relatively baby uh, organization there's only four of us um, we've been in existence not quite three years and we work with education leaders around the country um, we've really been working on kind of a one-on-one -on -one, um, leadership coaching sort of basis now but really looking to expand into developing a virtual community um, for you know we work with people, you know, across the states. So, for example, you know, we work with somebody in Arizona. We're having a, you know, the same conversation with a school based in New York that are struggling with the same things, but just really don't have the means to communicate with each other, um, especially. Um, past the teacher level, right? Um, it's lonely at the top. And so um, just trying to figure out ways to connect those folks. So we're we're in the beginning research phases. So I came across this hangout and just, you know, felt like I could learn from a lot of expertise that I was uh, bound to listen in on. So thanks for like, having me. Delighted to have you here. And you've got a whole bunch of super smart people in this room who are wise about the ways of community and education. What's your big question right now as you go through this process of building a community? Like what's, what is a burning thing that keeps you um, up at I night? mean, I think just really trying to figure out our mechanisms for keeping people engaged and, 
you know, uh, going over that tipping point of people not feeling like this is taking time out of their day, but actually adding time back into their day to be a part of a community. You know, it's principal or principals working as, you know, chief academic officers at that level. Like they just do not have the time typically or do not think that they have the time for something they deem as personal or professional development. Um, and so I think the thing that I've really been thinking about is, you know, how do we create an experience in a community that feels like this is like a sacred, you know, valid um, use of carving out an hour a week to spend some time on here and learn from others. Um, so I would say that's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, I think that is a core question. Just get it from like that, oh, I'm doing someone else a favor to the switch get to saying participation feeds me and nurtures me and like keeps me like contributes enough. Um, and, and I think that, you know, obviously your oral history work, I think is key to this because it's always for me been the question of having the deep conversations with my community members to get really um, clarity on just like what can they, what do they get from participation? What, what value can they get from that? And then shaping everything to, to really make sure you're meeting that need because, because if it's just, yeah, like, oh, it's interesting and new, it won't be yeah. interesting and new for long. Especially right now with the pandemic, I mean, teachers and educators have already kind of had a reputation for being short on time and, and quick to look for solutions and get in and get out and, what are we doing tomorrow or next week? You know, if they can think about next month, they're, they're it's like a luxury. And uh, coronavirus has just compressed everything so much that I don't know about you all, but we're just seeing a lot of just in time troubleshooting and that's it. Um, folks who have the luxury, the privilege of having more time to think longer term or just more a little more expansively has been really, really tough to get those folks. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's just, it's just a, this time has intensified all the stressors. And so it's just, it's even harder to provide value because the level of value has to be really high for them to stick around. Yeah. That's my experience too. I've worked, um, I have a North Bay, that's like the Bay Area uh, maker educator meetup that meets monthly. And we had to suspend that for COVID. We met a couple times just to do some best practices for delivering um, education remotely. But they just know there's no bandwidth whatsoever. And then such exhaustion from being on Zoom all day and then not to do something extra voluntarily is just beyond. And we even tried to deliver some uh, mindfulness practices. That's another project that I've been involved in to teachers. And they even like, unless it's in person, I just can't do it online. It's just, I'm dead. I can't do it. So um, I think sometimes it's okay to give ourselves permission to say, this is not the time to yeah. add yet another thing to, to yeah. everyone's work. But I just want to give Mercedes a moment to do a quick intro. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that was random. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Mercedes, and it's been so interesting hearing your perspectives. I actually forgot I had to introduce myself. Sorry. <laughs> so um, you get so used to attending things and just taking it in. Um, so I've had it of like back-to-back -back zoom calls so it's like i cannot go on another um camera call and i'm quite looking forward to <laughs> now actually <laughs> um i live in london and i work for a us-based um, not-for-profit ilta which is um kind of a legal tech association and i am their first employee outside of north america and my job is to help them expand into europe Ironically, it's also my first community job. <laughs> so <laughs> I spent a lot of my time trying to kind of understand what I should be working on. And my inspiration for community tends to come from the for-profit for -profit idea of community where it's around engagement, around the service or products. So I'd really like to hear what you all are getting on to, what you're prioritizing and to learn from you. That's why I'm here. Oh, thank you. It's good to meet you. Thank you. Congratulations on being yeah, the first hire in London. Yeah. Thank you. That's the US. <laughs> and I think almost all of us have stumbled into this community role by accident. Like, I just don't think 
there is too much formal education. So, so you're going to fake it with the rest of us. Um, but I will just want to put a plug in here saying um, that actually I have taken advantage of the CMX Academy that like that CMX offers. And they've got like, you know, these like basically self-directed online courses that take you through the process and offer some actually really helpful templates on just like how do we think about community? How do we sort of make sure it's tied into the priorities and delivering value to the organization? Um, so I thought it was totally worth it. It's going to take you like eight weeks, hour and a half, two hours per week. So I think it's if it fits your budget and your time, I would strongly recommend it. I think it's a great place to just give you a fabulous like grounding on like how do I tackle this community project? I think that would be great as a starting point and foundation. So thank you for that, Elijah. I will say that I'm working uh, right now on their um, community MBA, but I'm also planning on starting this month the Facebook community, like certified community manager one. All of their learning content is not behind a paywall. So you can watch all of the videos and do all of the learning without paying. And then if you want the certification, then you pay $100 and there's like a two hour yeah. test um, on video. Um, that sounds kind of intense, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm using that as my accountability structure <laughs> to like get this done. I did, the, I did the Facebook the Facebook community manager certification. I didn't actually take the test. I just went through their, went through the course. Yeah. It was interesting. It's very, for in my particular situation, it was really useful because it's very much about marketing a community. Um, and it's very, mm. and it's really about how do you use all the other Facebook tools alongside. So how do you use your Facebook page and Facebook ads and Facebook this and that? And since our community is on Facebook, and I recently also took over our our social media stuff, for me it was really it was a really useful sort of like way to connect what I was doing with what I needed to start doing. But it is mm. it is it is it is very much about how do you use how do you use these other Facebook tools to to alongside the, cool. the groups. How long did that take to go through that? Um, I did it in, I did it, I mean, I, I did it all in a week and I can't remember exactly how much time I was giving to it per day. Um, but I chunked, I chunked through it in about a week. Did you find it useful for um, non-Facebook applications as well? No, I wouldn't think it's in any way right. useful to people who are using Facebook. Got it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really about how to use all the different Facebook tools, which there, which is, which there's a lot of, there's a whole, there's a whole world of, of Facebook underneath. Facebook. So, so then like what's <laughs> like some what's like a super surprising thing that you learned about that you're going to apply? Um so I think I think the thing that I and I've started actually doing this a little bit already is is how to how to make how to leverage a Facebook page in order to get more more kind of people more awareness of your group. Um so like one thing that came um was this idea of how do you how do you advertise a Facebook group? And Facebook makes it, you can't actually advertise a Facebook, Facebook won't let you directly advertise a group. You have to, you can, you pull a bit.ly link out of your Facebook group and, and hide it from Facebook so they don't know that you're sending yeah. people directly to a group. But what they say is they say, get people to your page, do stuff on your page, advertise your page. And then they have a function in the groups where you can, where you can see people, if you have a page that's linked to the group, you can see people who have recently been active on your page and you can audit, you can invite them to join the group. And they're saying, well, that's the, that's the better way to go. Get people coming to your page and then bring them over to the group afterwards. Um, and I did some AB testing actually of that where I, where I hacked together a direct paid advertisement, like 50 bucks um, for, for, my, for the group and then another 50 bucks of people to come to the page. And then I would invite them from the page to the group. And we got in the, and, and it, they were right. It worked better to get people to come to the page and like the page and then go to the, and then from that point, frame, even though it's more steps and there's more barriers, it worked better. Yeah. How many people now, was I that? have a question. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, how many people did you get from the $50? Uh, what was I having? I'm averaging, I, I was getting about um, 50, 50 cents a member into a public, into a public social emotional learning group. Matt, there's a couple new community managers here, people who are starting to just like think through how would I build my community. And my question for you is, if you were to start from scratch now, 
would you still do Facebook again as the hub of your community? Or is it more of a thing that has happened because you just stumbled into it? Like, what do you think about it now looking back on your experience? Me? I, 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 yeah. am, I am all in on Facebook now. When we first started it, we picked Facebook because it was free. That was, the, that was the only, I was told when I came into my position, you're going to do Facebook because it's free. Um, and, and, all, and there's all sorts of issues with Facebook data. You don't know who the people are. But as far as like the experience that our members are having in the community, I think that it works really well. So if I think about it from the position of the members, I think that, that especially for mm -hmm. education, because there's a lot of educators who are already there. So it's really meeting, it's meeting people where they are in a space where it's not asking a lot of them to, uh, to come, come over. I would be really, I'd be really, I'd be really hesitant now to move off of Facebook because I, because of, because of, because, because I feel like it, it, it is, it is the right tool for getting, to, getting to, getting to our educators in the five minutes a day that they have available for our community. Right. So as an administrator, straight you hate Facebook, but from the user standpoint, yeah. you're like, oh, but well, you so know, and the barrier. other thing that yeah. makes me kind of feel warm and fuzzy about Facebook is that now I've been doing this for two years on Facebook, they're putting a lot into the community, into their groups. They're doing, a, they're investing a lot. I've been watching them develop. I don't know if anybody else. Is, so I run a public group and a private group and they just rolled out. A, I just got, I just got the opportunity to beta test their new public group administration they're totally redoing how they do admin, how, how the administration functions on public groups um to be a lot more like discourse where anybody can join but you have to you have to apply to be able to post um it's very different um and it's mm. still a little there's not there's some things i don't like about it but but it's a but it but but it's improving and that's i think something i really appreciate is that is that things are getting better and noticeably better every month which actually brings me to the next question, because uh, which is more LinkedIn focus, a platform that is famous for having totally <laughs> abandoned the groups for years and years, and is only now starting to like relook at that functionality. So question for Mercedes is, is there something like this for LinkedIn communities? And Mercedes, just to clarify, are you asking about sort of these training yeah, support materials? Yeah, I do materials? like um, the, uh, the example of what Facebook has, but that wouldn't be relevant for my audience because I do nothing on Facebook. Everything in Europe is very LinkedIn-centric, so it'd be good to know if LinkedIn has something similar for communities that we could leverage. And specifically, are you talking about the so the know, page level or the, the same? The, so, and we were discussing the certified community manager kind of um, education resource that um, Facebook has, and I believe the conversation was around how it's heavily focused on using Facebook calls. So I thought I'd like that, but for LinkedIn, if I could get kind of a community guide, <laughs> guide or how to guide for community managers for LinkedIn. I think that Facebook is really diving in right now to communities and groups. And so they actually have a full team of people that work with people that manage Facebook groups and they've developed all of these programs and content and this certification and these online trainings. But I haven't seen the same investment from LinkedIn. And I, I mean, I'm in whatever the maximum number of LinkedIn groups is, I'm in that number. <laughs> Like I have to delete one to add one. And that happened like four years ago. So it's not even a recent development. And I just like in all of them, people are like excited when they start it up, that it's going to be a thing to connect, that it's not Facebook. But I just have, I haven't found any group of the, I don't know how many, it's at least a hundred groups that I'm in, whatever the max is. Um, I just haven't found any LinkedIn group that like after starting, like continues having engagement and it doesn't, for me, it's not, also the groups don't show up in the algorithm into my, my feed. So I don't even get a reminder to go in that. But I'm curious for people who are actually active in the LinkedIn group, um, if there is an active LinkedIn group, like, does that show up in, in the algorithm, like in the main feed to remind you to go into it? Like, why would, why do you choose LinkedIn over a different platform? And would you, so would you recommend doing the Facebook course if you wouldn't be using Facebook? Are there learnings that you could translate to other communities, with, like from the people that have actually done the 
Facebook one. Matt, oh, is that you. me? No, I don't think so. I think yeah, that I think that it. there are there are basic like general community manager best practices uh, in there, mm -hmm. but they're they're pretty. I mean, they are. If you're really starting from, you'll get something out of it. But 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 most of it is around specifically around using Facebook tools. Um, mm -hmm. I think the 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 CMX content, even just going through the CMX, the, the free articles that CMX has. Um, would would be would be a better intro to general community management than the Facebook than the Facebook course if you're not using Facebook. I really yeah I think their templates like they just have the community canvas. I'd even start with the community canvas document, which is just like the one pager which just says like what is my community, how does it all figure out, like how have I tied everything to the goals. Um, so I'll drop that link into the chat in a moment too. But yeah, I would just recommend to everyone like do that. Even if you don't have to show your boss, just because it helps you go through the thinking and identify some of the gaps there. Um, I also want to just take a moment to say we've got a couple of new people who have stumbled <laughs> in. So we've got Sina and Osama who have both come in recently. Um, if you want to uh, come on, Mike, you're welcome to do a really quick intro. Um, otherwise, of course, you can throw that into the chat as well. Um, and Osama, if you don't come off mic, I will ask your question for you, of course. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. This is Sina. I'm amazed that you pronounced my name correctly. That's like a first, I think. <laughs> um, I work for a uh, NASA-funded education project out of Arizona State University. Uh, we create digital learning experiences for K-12 education. Awesome. I think we'll go ahead and introduce myself as well. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Asami Speak. I work for Juno College of Technology, and I'm the manager of both verticals there. Um, recently, we are thinking about how better engage the and so I'm trying to get more involved in, in these kind of conversations to figure out, um, you know, what works best um, in terms of engaging folks, but also rolling out services uh, for them and uh, ensuring that the, the services we do roll out are taken. Welcome. Um, the last part of you cut out a little bit for me, but maybe not for all. Um, but uh, yeah, do you want to try like just asking? I know you put some questions in about seven minutes ago into the chat. If you just want to share that with us here, yeah, that'd be absolutely. lovely. Um, so my, my question would be, have any of you um, rolled out a subscription service for the communities that, that you kind of created and um how did you kind of how did you go about it so uh was there a need that you identified first and then you decided that it might be a good product to roll out a subscription for uh and then if you could talk about some of the major challenges you faced with, with rolling that out and um how you increased uptake that that would be amazing. Anyone here got an experience bringing subscription into their community? We dabbled in it this last fall. Um, essentially, taking we wanted to it, it's sort of like a, a buy up, more intense training, like a combination of training mm -hmm. and and professional learning community. Um, and uh, it sort of. We we quickly ran into a tro we ran, we were piloting it. We ran into a problem of being able to create enough content that made the the price worth worth the price for people. Um, we were already kind of cre on the on like the training content side. We were already kind of creating as much as we could, and there wasn't a lot of we didn't have a lot of ability to create more um, to to fill it out. the 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 the, the PLC side worked really well um, for for the two times we ran it, uh, but but we just didn't we didn't feel like we were able to support it from a from a from a content side and so we we after we finished the pilot we didn't follow up on it thanks so much for that um and i guess uh did you roll it out to your entire community uh, or did you select a group of individuals to check? We have a selected group. So we actually, what it was, it was we used to do these these big these live these li live um, kind of fly-in courses for specifically for district administrators. So for very high level 
uh, people in, in, in public education. Um, and they would fly into Seattle and we'd, we'd, we'd do these very, this very intensive uh, four or five day thing with them. And we couldn't do that because of because of COVID. So we were looking for a way to replace, essentially, to replace the the that revenue stream, um, and uh, with a virtual with a virtual version of it, and um, and it just it, that so it was it was targeted at those people. It wasn't targeted at our regular community, which is which is much more classroom level, building level people. It was targeted at these at these high level uh, district level decision makers. Makes sense. Uh, and another, just one more follow-on question would be, uh, how did you go about pricing? Um, did you did you test a couple of different prices uh, with a few folks, or set one price and say this is this? We had, we we came up with a with a with a tiered pricing structure. So that so the idea would be that there would be like there would be, in you could you could you could buy a la carte. There'd be individual kind of elements of the program that you could pay twenty five bucks to access this special webinar or this um this live community you know plc meeting um or you could buy a subscription and you could get access to everything and there would be there'd be more there'd be 25 dollars level things and 50 dollars level things and 100 level things um but but we never actually got past producing anything above the 25 dollars level i mean that's where we started really running into the issue of well this is a great idea that we don't have the capacity to support right. got it yeah, thanks so much for that, Matthew. Would love to hear anybody else's uh, experience if they have uh, any with, with launching subscription services. See, community managers always <laughs> jumping in and moderating their own conversations. Love it. <laughs> Well, others are brainstorming that. I guess I can share a bit of the experience we've done within my own organization, TechSoup, which is sort of a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get and use technology. Um, so we haven't ever monetized the community functions themselves. For us, that's always been sort of like the acquisition, top of the funnel, um, and some of the training support side of the work. But we've got two pieces of subscription. The one thing we did um, was basically set up an online LMS with courses, which could be both a la carte and subscription. And we thought we were being super radical because our training and online like webinars and all that had always been totally free. And so we had a lot of conversations with our members and what we really determined is what they valued from this was gonna be the certification, a printable certificate, credits that they could apply to their professional associations, like say for fundraisers, the Association of Fundraising Professionals. You could get your courses pre-certified so you could say like, you're gonna get this many credits towards your professional certification. And so for us, that was really what we're ultimately selling through this educational stuff. Otherwise, you know, most of what we provide is available in some other form elsewhere, but we've done the due diligence to officialize it. Um, the other thing TechSoup has done, and I think this has probably been less successful, is we have got basically our Amazon Prime-y kind of thing, which is to say like, oh, if you're a power user, um, you could get a subscription to TechSoup Boost, which gives you access to cheaper rates for some of the things in our catalog or free access to some of the things which doesn't really cost us a lot to offer. Um, you know, so So that's worked a little bit, but I would say that, hasn't been as successful. I don't think people have felt the value there because I think often we're pushing the things that we're like, oh, we've got a lot of this. Like that's why it's you know in the discount area. And so it didn't have a lot of demand anyways. Um, but Jessica has been furiously typing. Um, why don't you walk us through this? Gosh, so I, I, is it okay if I pivot right now to the, my questions? <laughs> okay, so first question. I've been to a lot of online events, like in the past year, like maybe more than like 150. Um, and I was kind of curious for those of you who have tested out different platforms, either as a host or a participant, um, have you found anyone who's developed, whether it's through the technology or through how they structure the program, like that has the magic uh, during a conference of when you're like you're in a topic and you start talking to the person next to you and then you're like whoa like we have a lot in common 
like, and you continue that conversation when you're like walking between things or you like bump into somebody randomly or like where they like networking actually feels fun. Like, because you're like finding your people during a conference. Has anybody seen anything that felt like that? I, I'll go ahead. I'm just gonna. I don't have a lot to say, but um, not exactly a conference. But we use a platform called Remo, uh, where it's kind of like um, the screen is kind of like a floor plan. So you have an overview, like a top view of different rooms, um, like with little tables and stuff in them. I mean, it has little couches and stuff. It's kind of cute, um, and you can the user can navigate to whatever room they want to, and you can see the icons of the people who are in the room. Um, and there are limits. I think it's like six or eight people, or whatever, in each room. Um, but it kind of has that functionality. So you can like go into a room and there can be a topic. You can see just the people in that room and you can have small conversations. And to go to a different room, you can just sort of navigate on your own. So it's it kind of has that a little bit of that feel to it, I think. Do people take advantage of it? Do you see people in, engaging in, in kind of connecting with each other in the different rooms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's nice because it allows people to kind of navigate on their own. So if they wander into, wrong, excuse me, wander into a room where they're not really jiving with a conversation or just doesn't really apply to their topic, they can just go to a different room, they can pop in, and sometimes people will find a room that just really fits um, you know, it's really relevant for them. Hmm. Um, but, and then there's also like a, a speaker. So you can pull everybody back. You can give a presentation for everyone. So it has a lot of, um, a lot of good features. I don't know for a conference if it would work so well, but we've done like individual presentations where we have presenters in different rooms. We've done socials with it where we have um, like table topics and people can pop in and out. And then there's also sort of like lounge areas on the sides where people can just go in and chat. And they have little, um, the option to put in like videos and images and um, PDFs and things like that that you can click on when you go into a room as well. Thank you. Interesting. That really reminds me of the unconference rule of two feet where you very explicitly call people out and say, if this is not the right conversation for you, you are not being rude to walk away from it. And I've seen that happen all the time in conferences, both online and in person, where people say like, oh, I don't really like this conference, but I'm, it'd be rude for me to leave. And I wonder if giving people this 2D, like this fake physical space helps them have permission to say like, oh, here, there are other options for me. Like, let me go for a little walk. We used a platform called Wonder um, for our a, a big event that we did. Um, we had like a four or five hour event where people were going, we did it all of that on Zoom. And so you're basically hopping back and forth between various different Zoom meetings and Wonder. And we had that open uh, at a couple points. It like, the proportion of people who attended the event who joined Wonder was relatively small, but the people who did join Wonder had a really good experience and it was quite active just because there was enough volume. Wonder's also just like a virtual space. We had little squares where you put in different topic areas and it's like spatial audio. So as you approach a group of people, you begin to hear what they're saying. Once you enter their circle, the people ap appear on uh, videos so like you can see people sort of like this but it's a little bit more it feels a little bit more casual and then you can back away you can basically just like move your arrow key and you will slowly back away and eventually you sort of pop out of that circle um so like that's a hmm. it, like that worked relatively well all things considered um and is the best of the like spatial-ish uh, networking platforms that at least I've seen and tried. Anyone used Clubhouse? This is what I hear that hear all the cool kids are using these days for this sort of thing. I've been in Clubhouse um, pretty active since January. I, I actually think that there are some really great community manager, like weekly con um, conversations on there. 
um, the guy who's the head of community of Vanilla Forums has one every Friday at noon oh. um, Pacific time. That's really great. And you just kind of come in with a question or just want to talk. And I thought that one was really cool. And I know that David Spinks is starting to do CMX programming on Clubhouse. Like my hesitation there, although I do say, okay, first of all, the education community is there. There are like every hour of every day, there is a future of education clubhouse room. Hmm. And, but I've also found like, um, like Angela Mayers, who's like usually like a keynote speaker, a lot of education conferences. She has this, this website about clubhouse edu about how teachers can get on and how they can use it for professional learning. And she's always hosting things. And I have just been in so many rooms of educators sharing like strategies or just like emotional support for each other during the pandemic and it's been pretty delightful to see all of these cool clubhouse things and the, usually they're organ organic they're not actually like clubs where they've been like scheduled um so it's just kind of like i followed a bunch of educators and now they start showing up in my feed like as 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 options um but i will start looking for some events to link to you I think the, the one thing to watch out for on Clubhouse is what well, obviously it's Apple only for right now. Um, yeah. And I, I I haven't heard anything about Twitter Spaces, but they be they're on Android first, and so there might be some room there. The one thing I think to watch out about Clubhouse that I've seen from um, uh, our our community is that a couple of educators are like, you know that you all know that it's not accessible, right? There's no captions, and so hmm. if you've got folks who are hard of hearing. Uh, and you, you try to do something that is inclusive, then you might run into problems there. Yeah. I didn't realize it was Apple. I was about to say, why? I need to get on this. And I'm like, well, then I don't have a, I have an yeah, iPhone. Steal, my, steal my wife's phone. Yeah. <laughs> even if you have like an iPad, you, you could use oh. it, but uh, they send a text to your phone and then you just set up the account for your iPad. Um, but I mean, I, I haven't gotten to a point of posting anything on it. Um, right now, mostly because like the different communities that I'm managing, mm -hmm. like they're not all on it. And so it kind of feels weird to be like, I don't know, in a space that doesn't feel as inclusive because like half the population has, I don't even know if that's true, has Androids. Yeah. Um, and so they can't, they can't get in period. Um, and then the other people haven't gotten invites and we've done invite streams where mm -hmm. people just write, I want an invite. And so you're like, cool. I'll send an invite to two people and then those people will invite the next people on the list. And we were able to get like everyone that wanted on, on it really quick. Um, Old school, you know, nonprofit yeah. style phone trees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How do we bridge a digital divide in these things? You were here for nonprofit and education work. And I was on a call with the association of small and rural libraries last week. And their libraries have Wi-Fi, their libraries have internet, but their communities don't. And even a friend of mine in Northern California just said that when she goes to her mom's house, she downloads shows so that when she goes back to her house, she can watch them. And that's in California. So how do we be inclusive and accessible to these communities? What is offline work that can also be engaging in online work? I mean, that's something I'm going to have to really work on hard with my wildfire and stuff and my public library stuff. Yeah, no, I think that is really insightful. In fact, this platform we're in right now is an accessibility challenge for me and the work I do day to day because there is no phone call in like there would be with Zoom, a thing that drives me crazy all the time because I'm sometimes working with people in low bandwidth countries where mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll work, but I need to have a fallback. Um, so I, I think that's a fabulous question. And often where I land on it is to say, I just need to have a, a two track approach, which is to say, I don't want to be the last adopter because these accessibility questions are going to come later. So I'm going to say like, I might do a little bit of experimenting with Clubhouse, but in a very pilot constrained way, knowing that I will not roll it out to my community until we've resolved these larger questions because, because yeah, long-term, the things I want to invest in need to address those concerns you brought up. How do other people balance like that, that I want to play with the fancy new and the fact that the fancy new 
is high barrier in many cases. Yeah. I mean, I even find that for people who are like, oh, yeah, let's use Slack as as like our community platform. Like, uh, so I've managed like Slack, Facebook, um, and like five other different platforms. And I just find like it, like it, it's important to know the how tech savvy your audience is and like whether or not what you're trying to get them to, to do is like something that's easy for them and they're, they're willing to learn. Like for Slack, I found that teachers specifically um, aren't really excited about using that. Like they have Facebook already, so it's something they're familiar with, but like Slack works better for people that are already sitting in Slack all day or mm -hmm. in or jobs where they sit at their computer all day, mm -hmm. which is true for teachers now, but is not true post pandemic or pre pandemic. And they honestly are so burnt out from this year because they've never spent this much time on a computer that the idea of like learning and I don't know. Slack is not, it just doesn't feel like it's worked for any yeah. of the And they didn't sign up to be a teacher because they were super excited to play with hot new tool of the week. They, no. they, they were not that kind of geek. They were a different kind of geek. No. Like, and I, I hang out with a lot of geeky teachers because I'm on the board of computer using educators San Francisco. And so we host programming for geeky educators that want to learn rather than are required to like get a credit to learn. And so like, the geeky teachers like Slack didn't, didn't interest them. Like they're not even like, honestly, they weren't really active in our Facebook group even. Um, they like gatherings, which is why they are asking me, can we do, can we do an in-person gathering in May since we're all vaccinated? Like, like if we were any other group, it would be different, but teachers in San Francisco have like, are like at the point where in the next two weeks they, they will have most of them will have finished their second round. So they're like, okay, so if we just wait a few weeks until it's considered fully vaccinated, if we're all vaccinated, can we gather? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, like it, as a nonprofit, if that's like a liability or like feels okay or not yeah. to, to be doing that and whether or not it's like, I don't want to put anyone's families at risk. Yeah. So that, that way, even if their teachers are like vaccinated, like I don't, I don't know. And so yeah. if the if your county specifically says don't hold gatherings above this amount of people, which I'm sure my county does, um, I think it's one household with one household, that kind of thing. Then if everybody's vaccinated because they're educators, is that a different? thing of why you could gather in oh my god i really want to go deep into this how do we transition <laughs> out where what are the responsibility at liability levels just at like being leaders in our communities just like how do we want to represent and support the, the largest challenges i also want to say though we're at the end of our time um <laughs> but so you now have permission to leave that said, <laughs> so I see your, your hand is up. I want to say one thing before I do have to go, actually. And one is not only do you have to watch out for the liability, but you please be careful of the optics mm -hmm. because teachers are in a very specific place right now in terms of what the larger society's criticisms of them. And if there's a teacher gathering in person, there is, there's all kinds of ways that could be perceived and leveraged both for and against teachers. Um, people who are really desperately struggling to like make the case that they shouldn't have all their students back in the classroom and can, people can point to it as saying look the teachers are getting together you know there's they're, you know, they're just lazy they're just being lazy they don't want all the kids back in the classroom so there's there's the liability issues there's the logistical issues and then there's also the optics and I, I would say you know that's just as important that is such a good point I like that is so important. I have a proposal here. Would maybe two of you love to maybe help lead a conversation around this, how do we move out of the COVID moment um, for a conversation next month? Because I think, I, oh my God, I have so much to say about this. I really want to do this. Also, I would like maybe someone else to maybe help lead that conversation. Do I have any hands up or maybe two people who just want to sort of be the moderators on that? I would volunteer, but I don't. We don't have in-person meetings, and so for us, our business is as usual. Just our content will change. So, mm -hmm. 
I don't know that yeah. I could lead. I could I would have any particular insights other than the fact that my wife is a teacher, and I see all the politics going mm -hmm. on nationally, and that's kind of the only reason. What if we? So we, what if we had you as a co-leader? Anyone else, maybe, who is an in-person event planner, want to sort of be part of that conversation? Someone who maybe is a lady. In person isn't like my my <laughs> job, but I'm doing it like this nonprofit that I'm working with. It's like a volunteer position, but we're, we usually plan monthly events, and they used to be in person. And I mean, I could facilitate. Jessica, it can I volunteer you? I would <laughs> yes, love to do that. I'm volunteer. I just like <laughs> yes. I feel like we should make that only part of the conversation next time because I know it's 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 only relevant to like a way smaller group of people in our crew than like all of the things that we're doing online. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, like I'd be happy to do it, but like let's make that only part of the conversation so that way people can bring in other questions. Love about it. Other that sounds really good. Cool. It could extend to the, the in-person meetups of any of these communities because there are those things that the town halls those kind of things that go on with the other nonprofits when is it okay or how is it okay yeah to start the first one and uh, i think it it would be relevant to a bunch of different yeah. folks i think and i think that side question of like my sub community is all technically there but also is in a community leadership position and may just like politicians like there is always you know guy it's so different um, and the prediction that all of them will be hybrid now. Like, if you're going to do one, it's got to be hybrid. And how does one do that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And yeah, the, we've all been saying the word hybrid um, for yeah. a year now. And I still have no idea what that possibly could actually be. <laughs> not, not a clue. <laughs> yeah, it means so many different things to so many people. Like, I feel like hybrid in classes, like, in some cases was just, oh yeah, you spend like three days in the building and two days virtual. But then some schools are doing it where like, okay, some of the kids are online and some of them are in person uh -huh. and with a video camera. And I was like, that is awful. Like that is not accessibility. Yeah. Right now, all my teacher friends are basically, they've just doubled the course load. They're like, I have to do a full suite of online course delivery and also have in-person classes and I'm just having to do it all. And I just like, I'm so glad I'm not in those shoes right now. This madness. There, yeah. There's so much burnout. There is so, so much burnout right now. And then the stupid, the, the advocacy that I feel like I'm doing with the parent groups is they're like learning loss or whatever. I'm like, you guys are, so, that is so ridiculous. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. The least of our concerns right now. Let's just. <laughs> Let's just get through this thing. <laughs> Lost yeah. what? Like, what are you talking about? Anyway, preaching to the choir here. So, yeah. Jessica, Samer, before you go, if you can yeah. just drop your email addresses into the chat so I can follow up and gently harass you later. Um, sure. I think this is not going to be a heavy lift, but I think it'd be great to have other voices just in the hosting role. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Such I'll, a pleasure. Um, Go ahead. I'll bring some questions and then like when you guys, when we, people fill out their registration, is it possible to ask like for people to drop in questions? We can drop a question in there. If you had a prompt for that question, I can drop okay. that in. So if you drop that in to the chat here, I'm happy to put a prompt in so we can collect that as we go through the registration. And uh, Elijah, if you, uh, when you gently harass us, can you just, if you just connect us, then maybe Jessica and I can coordinate and collaborate. Yeah, hundred percent. I'll make sure that we come together. And maybe we'll even have just like fifteen minute, just like power conversation. Just say like, what do we want to talk about? How do we want to keep this going? But yeah, I think again, the mission statement of this group has been to keep it light and easy because um, uh, we all have lots of things in our lives. So let's not drive ourselves crazy. And I have a technical question: Is there a way to get a uh, save the chat? Because I want to save those links. The answer is technically right now it's. A super pain. It's a manual cut and paste. Um, unfortunately, it's in next quarter's feature release with Bevy. I have begged them over and over again, like, give me a chat saving thing. They're on it. They're on it. But the answer is okay. right now. Unfortunately, I would recommend just going through and cutting and pasting. Um, and you can't, um, this is the part that drives you crazy. You can only cut and paste one page of text at a time. Once you scroll, 
it uh, won't save that, which makes me want to scream sometimes. Okay, so I I have two questions. Um, please revise as needed. Sure. Uh, so I guess like the first one is about the topic, and then the second one is like to make sure that we like aggregate stuff for like what else people want to talk about, so that way it's super clear to people that this this like our next meetup isn't just about in person yeah. gatherings. So. And I mean, maybe it makes sense for it not even to be April, for it to be May, because maybe in May it will be more realistic that more people are hearing this. But for me, like, I don't know, like, I feel I feel like if if we might be able to gather in like June or July, I would yeah. like to have a conversation sooner so we could like put together the logistics of what that looks like, of whether or not we need to be distant or not. I don't even know. Um, my brain so, yeah. is all over the place here. Sorry, to, just to be, make sure I caught that correctly. So you were thinking you'd prefer to have this conversation in April rather than May. Is that right? Well, I don't know. I was kind of curious what you all were, were thinking. Of. I think, I think April, because you want more, you want people to have time to, to prepare. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I just want to, I'll follow up Matt, the official leader for the next one. Um, he's, he's, and he's going to change the time, I believe, to make it new, uh, a different time, one hour later, I believe it is. So one okay. o'clock Eastern. Um, this looks good. Um, I will do a quick edit and send these questions back to you just because I want to make those real short just to fit the, the question prompt. Um, but that sounds super great. Um, thank you so much. And I will get back to you as well. Stay like, are we doing April or May? Or do we do another one in April? Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you could totally do a second event. Who's to stop us? Our, our calendars. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. that's yeah. fair. <laughs> Lovely. Um, oh, um, Summer, did you get the uh, cut and pasted things you needed from this out? That's fine. You know what? Uh, I will, when the moment comes where I need these tools, I'll just bring it up again as a question. Okay. And then... I, oh, there's not that much text. Okay, I'm going to get this copy out and I will drop this into the, the slacks. I'll, I'll copy and paste this before we get out of here. Don't worry, I'll have that. You don't... Elijah, you don't have to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is it. my job as a host here. I get to play that role. You know, grunt work it's for me. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Such a pleasure. Again, thank you to both of you for putting up your hand and being voluntold into this thing. I'm super excited <laughs> uh, to bring other conversation leaders in. And uh, I'll take it from here. Okay. Thank you. You all have a good day. Lovely. All the best. Bye. Bye.